questions. So for today's presentation, we're going to get started by just recapping what we did last time. And just so you know, um, we're going to send the recordings of both halves of the presentation um, at, in an email following our time together today. So you can be looking forward to that. Um, so the recordings both will be available uh, within the next couple of days. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is that we will we will save time for questions at the end. If you think of a question and you'd like to write it in the chat, feel free, uh, but we may just hold off on those until the end. Um, okay, so let's get started. So this was our um, agenda from the very first, uh, first 15 of these writing tips. Um, and our goal with this presentation was just to give you quick, easy tips that you could incorporate into your writing life in order to grow um, in your skills. So you can see we broke this down kind of into the writing process where there's uh, before you begin writing, just thinking about your mindset, how reading is such an important skill in writing, um, researching pre-writing, and then we just barely got started into actual writing. So the writing process is, is somewhat involved. And so we want to just take time to make sure we're kind of going through each step by giving you tips. So today we'll finish our presentation with writing and then getting into revising and editing. So uh, go ahead, Carlos. Sure. So I'm taking this first uh, step here, step 16, and uh, it's focused on um, kind of a hot topic right now, kind of a, a buzzing topic of, of this generative AI use, uh, you know, to to help uh, writers uh, generate text. Right. And one of those tools is using chat GPT. Um, and we know uh, this is, you know, quite a debate right now. Many faculty and, and scholars um, have varying views, right? But um, there are some recognized limitations, right? And so we want to highlight a few of those specific limitations about this tool um, and how it can impact our own writing process, right? So um, there is a, a term that they use called hallucinations, which um, is essentially incorrect information that can be generated. Um, also biased information, right? The, 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 the founders or the creators of the technology and the text that is coming in um, can be biased. Um, also, there's a lack of clear credibility, right? A lot of time, some of the content I know comes from the, the social media platform Reddit, right? And it's collected, right? So we have to really um, be critical about uh, the credibility in the ideas that are being generated. Um, also, a lack of human insight. There's critical thinking pieces missing. Um, also, you know, that human element of, of building on personal experience is, is definitely uh, missing. And also, it can be um, tend to be overly long and wordy responses that are often redundant. So um, one task that we would, you know, have you... Um, you know, take on as you are um, thinking about possibly using some of these tools in your own writing process is to maybe take a prompt, you know, from a previous or current course syllabus, review the assignment requirements, the rubric criteria, submit the prompt, you know, to the, 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 uh, the chat GPT site, then analyze that response, you know, ask yourself these questions, you know, does the response fully meet the assignment requirements? Does it fully meet the rubric criteria? Are there credible peer-reviewed sources that are included that show clear credibility? Also, ask yourself about critical thinking. Has that been clearly represented in the response? Um, and how will you go about checking the accuracy of that response? And then lastly, kind of looking at kind of the larger picture, you know, asking yourself, you know, what are you essentially gaining or even losing, right, from um, your education, you know, in terms of relying on the tool, right? There's something about that investigative process that is missing, right? When we tend to be over-reliant on these tools, right? So um, while the debate is out, we do recognize that there are some significant limitations here. And so we just want to um, ask you to kind of challenge yourself, right? And to um, be 
uh, introspective about, you know, the ways in which this may support or actually can maybe inhibit that learning process and that writing development. All right, so I think I'm going to send this back to Gina. Believe. And actually, you can just go ahead. Thank you, Carlos. Um, mm -hmm. So um, th some of the best academic writing really is seamless. So one of the ways to get your writing seamless is to use um, one of these really wonderful um, techniques that's called the known new principle. And um, you would basically just link all of your ideas from sentence to sentence and from paragraph to paragraph by looking at the last idea mentioned in the preceding sentence, and that's referred to as the known, mentioning that in your new sentence right at the beginning, and then adding the new information in that new sentence. And then in the next sentence, doing the same thing so that you're actually going back and creating a little bit of a seam back through and weaving back and then moving forward. Um, this is a really wonderful way to achieve that seamlessness, what we refer to as flow. And if you look on the next slide, it gives you an example of this. And so they've, what they've done is they've highlighted in color the things that are being repeated. So we begin with this chapter was written to introduce the reader to the basic concepts of Alain Badur's theory of ethics. Then the next sentence, we mentioned that known idea right away. Bajir's concepts, and do you see how it creates that, that nice cohesion from that last idea to this one, will be explicated in the context of cont other contemporary theory theories of ethics. So that's the new. Then next sentence, we refer back to the known. In addition to this explication, the reader will also be presented with three critiques of Bajir's theory of ethics. So we have that new, the three critiques and, um, and so on. So that weaving back and then moving forward is a really wonderful strategy to use when writing. Okay. And the next tool um, is to really think about substantiation. And by substantiation, we don't mean just citing, not just putting um, a parenthetical citation at the end of a claim, but really looking at the claims themselves. You want to ensure that every claim that you make is really supported by factual evidence. So you want to avoid big global claims that really are more like overgeneralizations. And here's an example. Women earn only a fraction of what men earn. Really, really difficult because it's so broad and so huge. So the first task we'd recommend is to use the example above. Find a place where you can get the information and substantiate the claim about women's earnings by including evidence from at least one reliable source um, and be as specific as possible. So where could you get that information and substantiate it? And then ask a colleague to read your paper. And then every time there's a generalization, have your colleague um, say, prove it to you so that you've got this little voice reminding you that you have to prove every time that you make a generalization like that. Okay. And uh, I think this is Julie's, yes? Yep. Yeah. All right. So the next, um, the next part of, you know, how we can really increase our skills in these areas is to sum summarize. And summarizing is a skill we've been doing as writers since we were very young. Um, I remember writing many book reports in third and fourth grade when um, you take, you're reading an entire book and you condense it down to a small amount of text. So to do this effectively, we need to be true to the original writer's ideas. So we really must carefully read and understand the text. Then identify the key points, the main points, and paraphrase them into a shorter version. And then of course, you always need to take that last step and go back and check the summary against the original, making sure everything was um, summarized correctly. So um, with each of these, um, 
suggestions, these tips, we've also added these tasks. And our purpose with that is at the end of our session today, we'll leave you with a handout and you can take those tasks and maybe day by day, try one of these things. So this task is, um, I think a fun, fun exercise, uh, sometimes called a Goldilocks <laughs> summary. So, you know, with Goldilocks, it was too hot, too cold, just right. Well, we're going to see how that works here with summary. So the task is to read a piece of writing that's fairly long and then write some summaries um, to various lengths. OK, so the first one would be to take a article or, you know, a longer piece and then read it, understand it, summarize the key points in a paragraph of about five to sentence at five to seven sentences. So that's a pretty typical length for a paragraph. But then the second would be to write a three sentence summary of the text and then write a one sentence summary. And the last challenge just for fun is to write a one to two word summary if that's even possible. So just to kind of understand the, the different skills you're using in summarizing by looking at those different lengths. Um, and that's how the, the Goldilocks principle works there. So now we're getting into revising and editing. So those were, and some of these writing tasks versus revising, they really overlap. Um, but now we're gonna just talk about these final, final tasks we take. So one of the things that's important about, especially about, um, scholarly writing, uh, but really about any writing, is using very precise language. And um, we could also call this operationalized language in some contexts. So in this case, um, we are using, we're avoiding vague language because it can confuse the readers or qu uh, create questions in their minds. So instead, try to really rely on precision. So for example, instead of writing before Title IX, women were not taken seriously. That's very, very vague. Um, and piggybacking on Gina's discussion of substantiation, not only does it need to be you know, fully cited and proven, but it also needs to be more precise. So the revision could be before Title IX, women did not have equal access to educational resources, programs, or financial aid. So these are this this definitely makes it a lot more specific. <clears throat> and one thing to think about in terms of that operation operationalizing language is this is specific language that looks at observation and measure. So how spe what specifically does something look like? And then we define that with specific measures and behaviors and terms. So for example, instead of saying, she experienced panic attacks frequently, you could say instead, she experienced at least two panic attacks per month. So that's the frequency for the last six months that's the duration. She said that during the panic attacks, her hands felt clammy, her face looked pale, and she felt her heart racing. So those were very specific uh, behaviors that could be identified as symptoms. So it's important to really um, embrace that kind of precision or operationalism in your writing. The next one is to give yourself some time to let you and your uh, text rest. And this is an important part of the writing process. I was reading a little bit about um, Stephen King, who said, who's, you know, of course, written, sold millions of millions of books. Um, and he said when he, 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 he has this book called On Writing. And in there, he said he gives himself six weeks, actually, after he's written a new novel, he locks his paper manuscript in a drawer. Um, and the purpose of this is to really allow distance between yourself and your writing. Um, so you usually separate yourself in time, you know, about 
24 to 48 hours. And that time away from your work will provide you with a fresh perspective. So you can kind of see, of course, you know it, but it's you're, you'll be a little more objective when you come at it again and you're seeing it with fresher eyes. So the task here is if possible, because sometimes we're working under tight deadlines, but give yourself two or three extra days in the writing process. And when you finish a first draft, close the file and ignore it for at least 48 hours. And that gives you and your work time to rest and then open it again after a couple of days and allow that fresh perspective to revise with the reader in mind. Because a lot of times when we are in the writing process or the revising process, we are thinking about how, you know, how it's how the language sounds, but we're not maybe keeping in mind our reader as much. But when we can come at it with a little bit more objectivity, we can usually um, do that a bit better. Okay, and the next tip um, is probably one you may already be doing, which is using Grammarly. Grammarly is a proofreading tool that can help you avoid spelling and punctuation errors. Um, and you can use it as a tool either through your writing or after finishing your first draft. I work with writers who share their screens with me and they, they are like, oh my goodness, there are so many suggestions on here that are red or blue, you know, all these underlines. So I would say if that kind of um, is overwhelming, it might be better to just leave um, Grammarly off your desktop and don't, don't allow it to be seamless into your work. But then when you're ready for that very final draft, you can always copy and paste your text and drop it into the Grammarly website and then, you know, go from there and, and paste it back. So those are some things that I see with students. So it's certainly, you could try different approaches. And of course, being a Pepperdine student, you have access to a premium version. And I'll just link to that really quickly in the um, resources. This is on our webpage. And if you click on those resources, you click on the tab that says Grammarly, and then the, the um, access code is included there. And then for a task, you can consider really analyzing. I'm glad to hear that, Thomasina. Um, when, when you're looking through your, your reports from Grammarly, it can be helpful to see if you notice any patterns of errors or patterns of things that Grammarly is bringing up. Um, usually when I'm working with it in terms of scientific writing, it will identify the passive voice, which means that we are, the sentence is not, so it, let me give you an example. The, an active sentence would be, um, Officer Jenkins arrested the man. Okay, so here we have Officer Jenkins as the actor in the sentence. That's the active voice. To put that in the passive voice, you would say the man was arrested, and then you add the by the officer. And the reason why we use the passive voice more in scientific writing is because we're not focused so much on the, the researchers, or in this case, the active voice would be, you know, the 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 actor in the sentence, but more we're looking at the findings. So what was the content that came out of that? So usually Grammarly will point out the passive voice and with research writing, um, that's usually not an issue. But is a, do you see sentence fragments that it's pointing out or misplaced commas? So those are some of the things you can look at and try to learn from. And then um, the last one I'm going to talk about right now is this idea of hedging or softening claims. So when we are writing um, and incorporating research into our work, we have to be careful about the terminology we use um, because we want to make sure that we are showing 
correlation, but rarely causation. So if you look up here, there's a great book here by Swales and Feek about academic writing. And it's in our um, references on the handout. So if you haven't yet looked at that, you can check it out. Um, but the choice of verb, so they refer to a choice of verb, how that conveys our stance and the extent to which we believe the explanation to be correct. So because we cannot have, you know, we cannot often show causation with human subjects, we sometimes have to soften or hedge, you know, so we're not just jumping to the, you know, the sort of extreme connection, but we're saying there may be a link or there is likely a link. Um, so we can kind of think about that um, by adding auxiliary, auxiliary words like may, might, or seem, using words like likely, a definite possibility, strong possibility. So I'm gonna ask you to, to chime in here a little bit, at least in the chat. And if we could go to the next slide. Um, I want to just give us a little practice. So as we're thinking about this, we often um, can start with the strongest possibility and go all the way down to the weakest. And that's what is in that Swales and Feet book as well in those exercises. So as you're reading this, think in your mind, which one is the strongest verb, okay? So number one says, studies have concluded that excessive credit growth, and then you choose A, B, or C here, the global financial crisis. So is it contributed to, likely caused, or may have contributed to? And then, so you're going to put the strongest verb in the chat. So I'll give you a second to write A, B, or C there. Okay, I'm seeing some answers, A, a few A's and a B. Um, so in this case, I would say B is the strongest verb because of that word caused. So caused is a very strong verb showing that there is definite link or connection between two things. Whereas contribute means it's a little softer, right? It's like maybe there was a connection here, maybe it wasn't as that strong. And then C of course, <clears throat> excuse me, is the weakest because we have may have contributed. So that's the first one. Let's look at two, let's look at two now. So here you just have two to choose from. The survey results A suggest or B show that reusing sections from one's previously published papers is a questionable practice. So which one is stronger, do you think? A suggest or B show? Okay, great, I'm seeing a lot of Bs coming through. And I, I would agree with the Bs. So show is usually a little stronger, right? Uh, or demonstrate, show, these are things that, um, that have definite link or connection. Whereas suggest is a little softer. It's, you know, maybe it links to this, maybe it doesn't. Um, and then let's look at the third one. <clears throat> The latest series of studies, A, demonstrate, or B, question, the value of including consumer expectations in the assessment of service quality. So do you think this is, which is stronger, demonstrate A or B, question? Okay, so thanks so much for your um, your contributions here. So here I would say um, a word like suggest in number two or question um, in number three are a little weaker. They're not as making as strong a connection. But if you're using a word like paused for sure in number one, 
show or demonstrate in number three, these are usually a little stronger. So it can help you to, as you're reading um, maybe journal articles or your textbooks, look at the terminology that the researchers are using and see if you notice, you know, likelihood as, as they're softening their claims. And that can kind of help us to get um, some more information about that. And then the link on this slide is also in the handout. It's um, called the Academic Phrase Bank. And this is from a university in the UK. And there are lots and lots of examples and more information there as well. So we're going to talk just a little bit. I think probably many of you have used transitional words and phrases, but this is a way, if you haven't, when you go back to look at your writing and your revising and editing, think about using a transitional word or phrase to connect ideas where they're not obviously connected in your writing. Um, so as a practice, go back to a recent paper that you've written and then identify a few places in your writing where a transitional word or phrase could explain a relationship between ideas. And here's just an example. In fact, the words, for example, are a tr transitional phrase. Um, using words like however or nonetheless signify that you're introducing a contradictory idea. So instead of just having the contradiction there, including something like however or nonetheless, indicates that there's a contradiction. So they're little cues to your reader and they make it much easier to navigate the writing. I've included a link um, to um, that particular document. Well, it's to our webpage and you'll find a resource there that says transitional words and phrases. So you'll be able to find that in the chat. And the next suggestion is to read your paper aloud. And just by a show of hands, actually, how many of you actually read your papers aloud to yourselves after you've written them? Great, I'm seeing lots of hands, that's wonderful. It's a really great practice. Um, very, very important because it helps you when you read a paper aloud, you'll start to hear the writing more objectively. And um, so you'll actually be more likely to hear and see what your audience hears and sees when they read it. So great practice. Um, so um, after completing one of your papers, read it aloud, which you are all doing, and note the following. So one look for unity. Did you provide the reader with a roadmap at the beginning for example, a thesis statement with a blueprint or an overview for a literature review that breaks the paper into sections and listed in a particular, in that particular order. Um, flow, do the sentences and ideas blend well or are there abrupt shifts in topic? Um, and clarity, are the sentences clear or are they a little bit lengthy and challenging to read? And those are things that you can then go and um, kind of polish so that your writing sounds a little bit more coherent um, all the way through. And I see we have a question, Dolly, if you don't mind just waiting, we are gonna be answering questions right at the end here. So um, we look forward to your question. And the reverse outline. So this is a really fun task to do. If you've already written a paper and you feel that, you know what, it might not be as well organized as I think it can be, you can go back to your paper and instead of starting all over from scratch, number your paragraphs, look at the body paragraphs of your paper, and then for each paragraph, determine the main idea of that paragraph it might not already be written. So read the paragraph carefully. And then if there's not a topic sentence that describes that paragraph, put that uh, main idea right at the beginning of the paragraph. Then you'll want to delete any repetitive ideas or paragraphs if they're not adding anything new. And then you'll want to organize the paragraph so that they make logical sense. 
And then the last thing is the L. You'll want to link paragraphs and put them next to each other so that they are related and then determine if there's enough information for an entire section with its own heading level for that set of paragraphs. Um, and an easy way to remember this task is IDOL, idle. So um, practice doing that just to check to see, is this organized in the best way possible? Or can I go back and maybe tweak it a little bit so that it makes more sense and follows in a logical way? Okay. Great. And I think I have some of these final slides here. So here's another, uh, another acronym for you. Um, so, and some of these steps can also, like Julie mentioned, um, you know, we're kind of doing this at the actual writing stages and revising stages, right? So we're, we're thinking of it, we have this structure in mind as we are formulating the ideas and presenting them maybe in our initial drafts, but this can also be used as a tool to really check our paragraphs after, right? To ensure they have that cohesive structure. And so you probably have Maybe um, if you've if you've had a writing support appointment with one of us, or if we're reviewing something related to um, like a literature review where you have a lot of evidence and you're synthesizing sources, you might have um, heard us mention this uh, this meal plan. And I, I teach a class, uh, MSED six hundred one, critical thinking and communication on the education side, and I and I really love to emphasize this uh, meal plan, kind of uh, to really ensure that we are. Um, presenting ideas that are cohesive with from paragraph to paragraph and from sentence to sentence, right? So you can think about these parts of your paragraph in this way. Um, there's four pieces here. It doesn't mean necessarily that you have to have four sentences, right? Each of these, um, especially the middle parts, you know, might take more than one uh, sentence, but that first topic sentence we, we usually call that first sentence of the paragraph, the topic sentence, that's going to be our main idea. So it's almost like a, a mini thesis in a way, right? Where it's presenting that central claim, that central idea of that paragraph. After we've established that in a more general way, then we're moving to maybe some specific evidence, right? And that evidence can come in different forms. It can be examples, um, it could be text citations, right, with, with quotes or paraphrases, but we're introducing that evidence to support and add credibility to that first initial idea that we've presented in the paragraph. And then after that, we don't want to leave it just on that evidence, but we want to support that evidence with our own analysis. So this is usually going to be in our own words, right, where we're describing that evidence, we're interpreting the meaning, and highlighting that importance for the reader. And then the final piece would be that link, that linking statement. So here you're concluding that paragraph in a way that uh, partially summarizes those ideas and also brings the reader back. To that, to that central idea in that first sentence. And sometimes the, the A and the L can be one sentence at times, you know, to have that analysis and link there. Other times it can be separate. But this is really, if you have kind of more, my brain is, it likes formulas, you know, and it kind of is more of a systematic approach to analyzing, right, text. And so I can, um, you know, systematically go through my writing and check for these pieces um, to see maybe what's missing or what needs to be added or moved. So that is, that is the task here is maybe to choose a paragraph from a previous um, writing assignment or something currently that you're working on and, you know, pull one of those paragraphs uh, and assess its structure. And, and you know, this becomes... Um, you know, very prominent too when we're building on a lot of evidence, for example, in something like a literature review or in a lot of your assignments where you're asking to pull, uh, the prompts are asking for you to pull ideas from the textbook and support your claims with the evidence, right? So we can really utilize this, this structure here. So you can, you know, use that in some of your own samples or a current assignment and check to see, you know, am I following that meal plan? Is there something missing here? Um, do some of the sentences need to be reorganized or maybe moved to another paragraph? So this will really help you to ensure that consistency across paragraphing to ensure that cohesiveness. Oh, uh, yeah, I teach the MSED 601 um, it's the Masters of Science in Organizational uh, Learning and Leadership on the education side. Um, so yeah, Turnitin. Turnitin is another really great tool. 
um, that you all have access to um, independently as GSEP students, right? So you might you might find that some of your classes, the um, instructors have the Turnitin feature, you know, embedded into their course platform. But you, as a student, have access to the what's called a project site on the courses Sakai platform, and you can really use this tool to check for those instances maybe of inadvertent plagiarism or um, ensuring that you know you have um, paraphrased the ideas sufficiently or maybe um, need to add some quotes right to to certain texts and you can do this before you know you submit that final version to your class site because then maybe you know it might be too late you might have to have that feedback from your instructor you wouldn't be able to see that report right so you can really uh, use this tool independently for any stages of, of the writing process. And you can resubmit the same draft multiple times, right, to get an updated report. And so we won't go into too much detail here, but there um, are instructions on that resources page. I believe that that um, Julie might have added there. And you can also, um, I believe on the handout, there will be a link to access the site or instructions on how to access the site. And it's and it's like another class. You'll join it through the courses platform. And you might want to want to try this out because the, you know, um, it's good to have some practice in interpreting the report because there are a lot of times where some keywords are highlighted and, and that affects the percentage. So it's not, the number can be, you know, rather arbitrary. It's not really going to give you an idea of what needs to be changed until you actually look at the report, right? Like for example, um, some of my students are um, writing topics about like first generation college students. And some of those that phrasing, you know, becomes highlighted, especially if it's recurring, right? And that's going to affect the percentage, right? So um, we would want to kind of disregard some of those, you know, shorter keyword phrases and really focus on some of the larger pieces that are getting highlighted. Maybe there's some sentences or some larger passages taken from some of your sources and your references that maybe you need to rework or need to paraphrase and cite appropriately according to APA. So it's a very helpful tool. Um, and if at any time, you know, you have your report and you're unsure about how to go about interpreting it, or, you know, it looks maybe overwhelming or confusing to you, you know, I would just recommend setting up an, a meeting with one of our writing support team, and we'd be happy to help go through that report and really focus on some of the most prominent areas that might need to be revised there. Okay, but you have access to this as students independently and your instructor won't see this, you know, we will as admins if you ever need to retrieve your report or, you know, have need uh, have issues accessing the site, you can always reach out to writing support, but that's just mainly between you and the system there in, in interpret in, in viewing those reports. Also paraphrasing we know this, you know, this can take. Um, a whole workshop on paraphrasing, you know, it's it's definitely a challenge and it's it's almost an art to an extent, right, to be able to kind of restructure someone else's idea and really put it in your own words. But um, just just doing that process, you know, is is very um, is very helpful to the whole learning process. It, it, it does help you to retain some of those concepts more as you are in that process of paraphrasing and not just pulling the text exactly from the original source and putting it into your paper. Because also that would lead to something like over quoting, right? Which we want to try to avoid. Um, and it's also demonstrating to the instructors, right? That you have, um, you know, more solidified knowledge of those concepts and you're able to talk about them and to articulate them in a way that's your own voice that you're using, right? And so, um, you know, it's very effective in those elements of summarizing, synthesizing information, also focusing on, you know, what's significant, comparing and contrasting those relevant details. So um, our wonderful Julie Stegmeier has a great YouTube channel that um, has... So much content there, um, thousands of views and things. Of, of, she has a whole playlist of a writing workshop, but one of those um, focuses on paraphrasing. So um, this link here um, will take you to Julie's channel and um, has kind of a step-by-step -step process of, of, of understanding how to paraphrase. 
Um, and so that can help you to kind of build on some foundations of practice. We also have um, like a previous um, Jumpstart series webinar that uh, we provided on um, paraphrasing and plagiarism and substantiation. So some of these concepts that we've mentioned, we, we kind of elaborate more on those on our videos page. So you, you can definitely, you know, see that as well for a more in-depth, um, you know, tutorial or webinar on some of these concepts. But, um, you know, you might want to start to practice this, you know, and follow these steps where you are reading fully understanding the passage, right? We, we need to make sure that we can comprehend what we're reading before we can begin to restructure it and to re-articulate it. Um, obviously, you know, avoiding that similar language, possibly even restructuring the sentence. And then if there are any specific borrowed words or, termino or you know, terminology that is, um, you know, we can't just rephrase or reword, then we would want to go ahead and quote that. Um, and the last step here involves reflection. So there's been, a, you know, quite a bit of research on just the uh, purpose and the benefits of this reflective practice. And so building on some, some past theories um, from shown in some, all these sources are in the handout references. So if you have any other, you know, if you'd like to, to read more about some of these ideas, we have those listed in the references for you, but we, um, come to realize that this reflective practice just really helps us to engage in that continual learning process, right? Um, and it helps us to really critically analyze our own experiences, recording that and really assessing how we might um, go about doing this or, you know, doing that same experience in a new setting, right? How, how would we what can we learn from this experience and how will that change us or how will that develop us moving forward, right? And so um, there is this uh, reflective practice toolkit from Cambridge University. Um, and I'll just go to it briefly here so you can get an idea um, of what a great resource this is. And so it really breaks down the whole process of um, just reflecting um, from experiences and also specifically writing reflection. So there is a section on reflective writing. So it just really, I love how it breaks down some models of reflection. So it's really looking at um, some of the um, metacognitive pieces. I think that brings us back to kind of the first slide that Gina was mentioning about kind of looking at the writing process as a whole. And it really brings in some theoretical foundations for kind of the benefits of reflecting and this reflective practice. So it really breaks it down really well. And it has some exercises that you can, um, that you can do here. Sorry, the different. So it kind of breaks down the purpose of reflective writing and it also gives you some different types of practices. So it'll give you some prompts to, to and it, it uses the free writing, which was one of our steps in the first half about free writing. Um, and then um, it also, you can also use a sample of your own writing, right, to do this, to do some of these exercises. But um, there's some links here and, you know, just to get you more familiar with that process, we encourage you to kind of, you know, browse that side and, and, and use some of those steps to, to really become comfortable with that process. Because the more that you uh, do that process, right, with anything, repetition and practice, hopefully it will, you'll become more accustomed to it and more comfortable in having that, you know, introspective piece about what you're doing, right? Thinking not just satisfying the writing for the course, right? But looking back and thinking how you went about that process, which is really um, the large reason why we're here today, right? To help you with that. 